My son and daughter-in-law are taking a brief vacation, and so I got to farm sit at Phelps Farms this week. Uh, always like that. Our uh, spring lambs have all gone to the packing house, and we have a lot of lamb now. Um, good old grass-fed lamb, some of the best meat you can eat. Uh, but now the, the summer lambs are coming in. So last week I had six brand new lambs bouncing all over the place, and... Uh, Lambs are about the same size as little people when they're born. They're six to eight pounds or so, and we had one that was two pounds. Little premature lamb, the cutest little thing, and they generally don't make it when they're that size, but Ty milked the mother, and we held up the little lamb and, and fed him, and then we taught him how to eat. When they're that little, you have to teach him. And he's doing right well. And so I spent all week uh, watching this little lamb. Uh, if, if you haven't seen them while the parents are out grazing, the little ones will find a hill or a pile of rocks or something and play king on the hill. Funniest looking thing you've ever seen. They'll knock each other down. And that little lamb gets in there and scraps with the rest of them, even though he's about a third the size. I'm really attached to him, and I'm probably going to miss him when it's his time. But <laughs> Erica gets real attached to them, and... We don't tell him we take him to the packing house. When she just notices one missing, we, we say he went to freezer camp. <laughs> well, I guess we need to talk about something spiritual, don't we? How about George Foreman? Uh, George Foreman, age 65, is a Baptist minister. Don't know if you knew that. Uh, this generation may recognize him as the smiling, uh, jovial spokesperson for the George Foreman Grill, but, you know, there was a time when George Foreman was the most feared boxer in the world. Uh, he won the heavyweight title by demolishing Joe Frazier in, in 1973, and after knocking out Ken Norton in 1974, he signed to fight Muhammad Ali in Kinshasa, Zaire in what would be called later the rumble in the jungle. Now, many thought that Ali was a little bit past his prime, and, and Foreman possessed what many people thought was the hardest punch in boxing history, and that made Foreman a three-to-one favorite. And as the fight progressed, Foreman stalked Ali mercilessly, landing blows that would probably paralyze the average man. And by the middle rounds, Ali was leaning on the ropes, covering his face with his gloves, kind of like this, while Foreman just pounded on him. Uh, most observers, myself included, thought Ali was in trouble, and some even thought that the fight should be stopped because he wasn't even fighting back. Uh, Ali later referred to his defense as rope-a-dope, <laughs> and it served him well as the massive Foreman fighting in the African heat and humidity, tired and punched himself out, and Ali rallied to win the eighth round. You probably wonder what this has to do with Ephesians, don't you? Turn to Ephesians, if you will, chapter 6. Ephesians 6. I want to remind you that as we, we undertake our study of the Pauline literature, uh, taken in the order in which it was most likely penned, um, we're, we're looking at a a love letter, in essence, written by Paul to what's arguably his favorite congregation. And in the first three chapters, he's reminded them about what Christ has done for them. And in the last three chapters, he's saying, okay, so what? Because Christ has done this for you, how should you live? And so we were into the submission thing last week. We talked about submission and how we ought to submit ourselves to authority. And we kind of take up there in chapter 6 when he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I don't, did this bother anybody when you read that? Not that you're mad at your parents, of course. But did it bother you that it said this is the first commandment with the promise? Didn't bother anybody? Would it bother you if I told you that that's not true? Turn to Exodus, chapter 20, verse 6. Exodus 20, 6.
Right before that, in Exodus 25, it says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That sounds like a promise to me, doesn't it, to you? Well, then... Right down a little bit below that, it talks about honoring your father and mother. Don't get hung up in that. I'm just trying to get you a little wound up here today. Uh, And that can be interpreted. Some people say, well, there goes the Bible contradicting itself again. Not necessarily so. There's some argument that in the Hebrew construction that that, that this is not a promise, but rather a warning. Uh, I think we're we're splitting hairs there. Uh, I think that when it talks about the first with the promise, it doesn't necessarily mean the first chronologically, but the most important. Look at it however you'd like. But he says, look, this is the first one with the promise. And he wants to make sure they understand the importance of it. I want to tell you that one of the difficulties that I have in, in doing what I do is that I spend so much time counseling with people. And, and, and you have to place your experience uh, as the filter through which you see your life. And so I, I say all that to tell you that I've, I've shared with you before, I was raised in Disneyland. I mean, it really was. I, I had a mother and a father who were incredibly loving, caring, Christian people who raised us uh, in the admonition of the Lord. Uh, I just can't imagine having better parents. And so in counseling, when I deal with the carnage that I encounter sometimes because of, of families that are dysfunctional, uh, an abusive father, uh, a mother who's not there, I have difficulty relating sometimes because I have no basis. I have no experience on which to judge that. And so the the admonition to honor your father and mother comes easily to me. My goodness, how could I not honor godly people like that? But some people struggle with this because Scripture says, wait a minute, honor your father and mother. Uh, They were placed in that position of authority. Uh, But let me tell you, it's no different than honoring a bad boss, you know, uh, even an abusive husband, it said to, to honor your husband, to, to submit to your husband. We are to submit to authority. That doesn't make right what they do wrong. But I want you to know that just like we talked last week when it talked about wives submitting, it, it also in reciprocity talked about husbands loving. Well, look what it says here. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I like the King James Version ad- admonition. But... This thing cuts both ways, just like all rights and responsibilities do. Does that mean that you're not to to respect or obey your parents if they've abdicated their responsibility? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that they also have a responsibility to be good parents, to be godly parents. The next, I really struggle with the next scripture because I've, I've, I've fought with it for years. Not that I don't understand it because it's crystal clear to me what it says. But it's, it's amazing to me how society could have gotten it this wrong for so many years. Because I have people on two different sides of this question have completely misused this. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of your heart, just as you would obey Christ. Now, lest anyone think differently, let me tell you that beyond no shadow of a doubt in my mind, uh, does... Th- th- there's no way that I think that this, that this says that slavery is okay. Now, you're saying, well, so what? I, how could you look at it any other way? Let me tell you what. There were generations of preaching who taught that, it, that they justified slavery by saying, well, look what the Bible says. That was wrong, R-O-N-G. Absolutely. No way was that right. And to this day, I cannot imagine how a person who called themselves a follower of Christ could justify slavery can't in my mind and yet here Paul instructs slaves to obey their earthly masters you think that this would be the greatest opportunity he would ever have inspired by the Holy Spirit to to preach against the evils of slavery but I want you to look at let's just set slavery aside for just a moment we'll come right back to it I want you to look at a couple of other issues Uh, the Bible gives us instruction for divorce And also says God hates divorce, does it not? The Bible gives us instruction on how to dig in polygamy while being crystal clear that God wishes marriage to be between one man and one woman. So the fact that God gives us instruction on how to deal with it does not mean that he approves of it 
or that he even tolerates it, but that he knows the hardness of men's hearts. Now, one of the difficulties is there has arisen a school of theology, uh, and if, if you've done study of other theologies within the Christian faith, you, you will undoubtedly have encountered it, and it's called liberation theology. It actually began in South America in the Catholic Church, and it, it will pop up among oppressed peoples as a gospel of liberation, saying that salvation is found through freedom, equality, and social justice. Did Jesus speak words about those? Absolutely, yes, he did. Is salvation found through them? Absolutely not. I don't know how you can justify that. Did Jesus preach about social justice? He was absolutely all about social justice. Is salvation found through it? No, it's not. So I want to set right what Paul's talking about here. Paul understood that in his lifetime, he was not going to eradicate the scourge of slavery. He says something very interesting in here. He talks about slaves' relationship to their masters. He says, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will remind everyone for whatever good he does, whether he's slave or free. Now look what he says to the masters. Treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. What do you have in common with your slave? You are both believers. And it's beyond me how you could, as I said, be a slave owner and be a Christian. Paul dealt with that in his letter to Philemon. Remember, the pastors preached a marvelous sermon about that when he says, Philemon, why did your slave Onesimus have to come halfway across the world for someone to share Christ with him? You should have been treating him like a brother. And he wrote to Philemon entreating him to take, uh, to take Onesimus back. Because their bonds as brothers were stronger than the bonds of, of slave and, and master. Let me tell you what I think he's talking about here. I can't do anything about the institution of slavery right now. It's wrong. He preached against it. Believe me, it's wrong. But he said, look, if we can't overturn it now, I want you to exist in your circumstances now because we've got to look further in the future. And let me tell you something that is probably... Uh, of little solace to the slave at the time. But what if I said to you, you can spend eternity in glory, Dennis, if you'll be a slave for one second. Now think about it. As bad as it may be seem to be a slave in, this, in your position in life right now, the time you spend as a slave is like that compared to the time you'll spend in glory. So right now, even though our position is not good, let's concentrate on eternity and not look at our current circumstances. Please do not think that because he tells slaves to obey their masters that he in any way approves slavery. He did not. But like all these reciprocal relationships, husbands and wives, children and fathers, what does he say the responsibility of the slave master is? Don't you dare abuse them and treat them like your brothers. Then I like the next section. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He wants to put it in perspective, and let me tell you what he's talking about here. He said, you see oppression, and, and let me tell you, if you're a believer, you will see oppression sometime during your life, or I've got to say you're not doing it right. You're too much like the world if you don't. But he said, look, you'll see oppression. That's bad enough, but that's not what you really ought to fear. Remember what Jesus said in, in another time. He said, you don't need to fear the people who can put you to death. But fear him who can put your soul in hell. He said, there is battle going on up there, and as big as our oppression may seem right now, as big an issue as that seems, there is spiritual warfare going on. Now, I'm not going to go all twilight zone on you here, uh, but I want you to know uh, you don't have to be charismatic. Uh, you don't even have to be Baptocostal to believe that there is spiritual warfare going on. Absolutely. 
Somebody asked me one time, do I believe in demons? Well, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I, I don't uh, slap people over the head and try to drive them out of them. I don't look for them underneath every pew. But I believe definitely that Satan is alive and well and his demons are too. I really do. Do I believe in demon possession? Yes, I do. I don't know what form that takes. Uh, I don't know exactly how that works, but I think it's definitely scriptural. And I think that there is war going on out there between the, between the forces of the heavenly and the devil. But what he's telling them is, okay, put aside the battles that we've got to face in everyday life. The fact that we face oppression. Here's what I want you to do. What is your role in the heavenly, in the cosmic battle between good and evil? What is your role? And it might surprise you. He tells you to put on the armor. Now he's done to describe it. Put on the full armor of God so that when the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth tucked, buckled around your waist. Let me stop right there. Did you notice, because I tried to emphasize it, he used the word stand three times. Did you notice he didn't say charge anywhere in there? So what picture do you get? We're playing defense here, folks. We're playing defense. He said, stand your ground against the, ch against the charges of the devil, against the offense of the devil. We are to stand firm against it. Did he say rebuke the devil? He did not say rebuke the devil. You will not find that in Scripture. Let me tell you right, we're going to talk more about this later, but I want you to understand that. What is our role as believers? We are to stand using the defenses that the Father has given us, provided by the Holy Spirit. What are those? He listed the first one. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. What did Jesus say? I am the way. Okay. And the picture that you get in Old Testament prophecy is of the ruler with his signet. This is the sign of his authority, the belt. So as the believer, what do we have as the buckle for our belt? We have the truth. I don't think we make a big enough deal about that these days. I really don't. If you read the pastor's blog, uh, the latest one, it's a couple of days old now, when he talks about our defense, why do we have to seem like we justify the exclusive claims of Christianity? Christianity says there is one way to the Father. Now we've got this kind of mealy-mouthed, mushy, soft Christianity that says, well, but that's okay for me, but, you know, you can probably do the same thing your own way. Uh-uh! We've got to stand firmly for the truth. What's the best defense? The truth. So he starts with that. You've got the buckle, the belt of that wrapped around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate, if you've seen the old, well, you don't have to see the old Roman, Roman movies, if you've actually acted in any church production, they've got this plastic breastplate, which wouldn't have done a thing to stop anybody. But uh, the real ones were a little tougher than that. It was a defense to, to protect the upper body against sword slashes and, and sometimes against arrows, but, but mainly it was to protect the vital organs. What's, what's protecting us? Righteousness. Is it our own? What is our righteousness like? Filthy rags. So it's not our own righteousness. Whose righteousness is it? God's armor is the righteousness that Christ imparts to us. With your feet fitted with the readiness... Excuse me, let me back up here. Breastplate in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. One of the things that I like is that uh, the idea about how beautiful are the feet. Remember that, that quote, how beautiful are the feet of those who, who, who carry the gospel? It's going to be part of my message next week, next Sunday morning. And, and look how he works it in here. Uh, the, the Roman soldier had very special boots made. They didn't fight in sandals like you see in the movies. They had very special boots that they wore to allow them good footing during the battle. Even talking, I don't know if you've ever uh, done any running or if you've, even if you've ever been out to play softball and you get ready to get up to bat, did you ever stop and lace up your shoes real tight, Mike, just because you, you, know, you just feel more secure when you got those shoes all, all tied up and ready to go? He says, lace them up, boys. You've got the gospel of peace. That's the, that's the beautiful feat. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. 
Remember the Roman soldier had two different types of shields. One was tall. They stood in a phalanx to protect the man next to him. The other was a buckler that was a round shield that they parried uh, arrows and sword strikes with. We've got faith to ward off the blows of the enemy. With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation placed on our head to cover the brain bucket, as they call it. Okay, to cover your brain, the helmet of salvation. And then it mentions the one offensive weapon. Did you ever notice that? All these things that we're mentioning, you know, the belt, uh, the, the breastplate, the helmet, the shield, all those are defensive weapons, but there's one weapon that the Christian have. What is that? The sword of the Spirit. Sword, what does that mean? Oh, come on, if you were a little Baptist, you did sword drill, right? What did that involve? Your Bible. The, 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 his word is sharper than a two-edged sword, so that's the one weapon. Now, I want you to stop and think. Scripture, what's the weapon that we have? And what example do we have? When, when, when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan was tempting him, did he just backhand him and slap him in the face and say, Shut up. What did he do? What, what was his weapon? The sword of Scripture. He answered him with Scripture. So what is to be our weapon? God's Word. Remember, one of my very favorite verses is Revelation 12, 11, about how Satan's eventually going to be defeated. Two elements. The blood of the Lamb and the Word of our testimony. That's the Word. That's our weapon. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the saints. So it talked about how we're going to defend ourselves against the attack from evil. And have you noticed what kind of, a, what kind of defense we've got? It's rope-a-dope. It's rope-a-dope. We don't, we don't rebuke Satan. That just gets all over me sometimes when I see some TV evangelist saying, Rebuke Satan. I rebuke you, Satan. I just say, Whoa. What are our weapons? Take it. That just so flies in the face of our uh, MMA society. We want to put a whooping on them. Well, let me tell you what. You don't have the strength. You don't have the power. You do have a Savior, and He's given you tools to defend yourself. And it says, stand firm. Use the weapons that I've given you. Pray. Pray continually. I want to read something very interesting to you. I'm pretty hard on Joyce Meyer. I'll admit it. Uh, I think she has strayed down some paths she doesn't need to be straying, particularly in the word of faith movement. But I want... I want Many times she's had, I think, some really bad doctrine, and she's come to realize, I think the Holy Spirit's revealed to her uh, how bad it was. And I want you to, these are her very words. During the first several years after I became a charismatic Christian, I listened to a lot of teaching on spiritual warfare. I tried to learn all I could to defeat the devil, because it's obvious he was giving me a lot of trouble, and I wanted the upper hand. It seemed I gained no victory from applying all the methods I'd learned. Then the Lord graciously shared some truths that have become a blessing in my life, and he showed me that spiritual warfare methods are good, but they're only carriers for his real power. I was busy rebuking, resisting, casting out, casting off, binding, fasting and praying, anything else anybody told me to do, but had no results, and I was worn out. I was getting to the point of spiritual burnout. God opened up a whole new way of looking at spiritual warfare when he challenged me to observe how Jesus dealt with the devil. As I studied his ways, I didn't notice that Jesus didn't do the things I'd been doing. For example, I learned that re remaining obedient is spiritual warfare. We often quote only a portion of James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee. That's not the whole story. I saw the whole scripture, so be subject to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The first part about submitting to God is just as important as the second part about resisting. 
So I want to disabuse you of these ideas that somehow you are empowered and you can go about rebuking the devil. That's not your job. Jesus can handle the devil. The devil's fate is assured. There is a place awaiting him. He knows it. We know it. Our job is not to rebuke him. Our job is to do what? To resist him. I don't know about you. That was spiritually very liberating for me. Why do we want to rebuke the devil? Really? Power. You know, I want the power. Isn't that just the antithesis of what Jesus tells us we ought to be? We are helpless without him. Totally helpless. So when Paul talks about resisting the devil, he means just that. Rope-a-dope, folks. Rope-a-dope. Get on the ropes and take it. That is so un-American. We don't want to take it. I'm not going to take it anymore. That's a part of being a believer. It really is. What's the reward? The crown of life. I like his final greetings. Don't ever look saying, well, this is the meat of the scripture. Let's just do away with the goodbyes. It's so rich when Paul signs off to a church that he loves so deeply. Tychicus the dear brother and faithful servant of the Lord, by the way, he was uh, one of Paul's friends, likely an amanuensis, uh, who actually carried this letter in person to the church at Ephesus. He will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. I love the fact that Paul always gets in peace, grace, and love. He doesn't ever want to let them forget it. And as I look, I look back on these scriptures and I say, okay, what am I to take away from, from what he wrote to the church? If he wanted to leave a legacy in writing, uh, Inspired by the Holy Spirit, what did he leave to the church that loved him so much that when he was going to Jerusalem, he thought to his death that they met and huddled up and prayed and wept bitterly because they loved one another so much? What did he want to say to them? And if, as I look back over the six chapters in the letters to the church at Ephesus, I see that he establishes first. Let, let's make sure we understand this. We are sinners. Okay? Christ died for those sins. He took our place. And then he says, what should our response be? We ought to live a Christ-like life. How successful are we going to be at that? Not as successful as he was. But we're never cease doing that. And what is a big part of that? Remember when we kind of struggle through the part about wives submit to your husbands husbands love your wives how did all that discussion start submit to one another because what was foremost in the body what did he want more than anything else in this church that he loved so deeply unity he wanted unity well that was then and this was now and we got politics and you know we've got church meetings and that kind of thing is that stuff not applicable to us today. So I, I hope you're with me when you, you, you've been able to recognize that each week as we go through the Scripture verse by verse, let's study what it says, let's talk about what it means, and let's talk about what it means to me. Is it applicable in my life today? Is the Holy Spirit still moving in my life? Is what Paul said to the church at Ephesus what Paul would say to us? I think so. I think so. So then the next logical question is what is our response? Well, it's 10 30. Time to go home. Our response ought to be change. We can't be like them because we are not like them. They are not us, we are not they. I don't know how many other ways to say it. What Paul said is you can't be part of that world. 
Have you noticed that most of what I advised you, what Paul advised us in the last three chapters, are an anathema to American society today? Have you noticed that? So you're left with one of two conclusions. Either he just got it wrong, or we've gotten off track. I prefer to think the latter. I think he got it very right under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when God gave it to, 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 him, to them to write down. And, and he recognized even in the day that false teachers were going to creep in and we were going to be drawn inexorably, continually, strongly to the world. Because we are, after all, sinful fallen people. But what is our charge? I like the way, I don't even, it's been used so much, I don't know who to credit for it, but I like the, the metaphor of uh, church as a football game. You realize that what we do today is the huddle, don't you? How many games are won in the huddle? Because sooner or later you've got to get out and execute, and you realize the real church happens when we leave here today. When we leave here today, that we look at what he's given us to do and take it to heart. Next week, Philippians. Please read forward, if you will. I was going to tell you, please read chapter 7 of, of Ephesians, but I figured somebody would get all mad at me when I do that. So, so uh, as, as it so happens, finally, we've got a couple in order, and the next, next one written was likely the, to the church at Philippi. So please read that, if you would. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it glows, Father, that it's light in a dark world. Father, I pray that we be illuminated, Father, and that when we leave this place today, that we would indeed be people sharing Jesus. Bless us as we go today, Father, for we ask it in the precious name of your Son. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.